We have a very special guest for you today. We have George McLeod, Access Mining, and he is really an expert on what I call the geopolitics of the mining industry. A very underexplored topic in my view. And George is, that is his expertise. I mean, he might call it, I think, politics, but it's fascinating. And he is basically saying how these energy metals, these industrial metals, especially as they go up in price, will increasingly start to take on a kind of the geopolitical significance of oil and that mining companies are a lot of them are not prepared for the kind of scrutiny they're going to get, particularly from developing countries. So very, very interesting stuff. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, and I am back from my little sojourn into Italy. And, uh, you know, I have to say, I think the highlight I started in Bologna, then I went to Ravenna, and then I went to Florence. Florence is like the big city, okay? But Ravenna, the mosaics in Ravenna are, you know, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like it from an art perspective. They have to be seen. There's about six UNESCO sites there, and uh, they simply have to be seen. There's, There's no art experience that's quite like that. And that took me by surprise. I always liked mosaics, but these were another order of magnitude where days later, you are still feeling the impact of that experience. And how many paintings can you say that for? You know, so anyway, a small recommendation there. I am back in uh, this disaster in Afghanistan. Uh, You see the 10-year note has dropped to 1.225. I mean, still kind of really holding steady when you consider the just it's hard to put a good spin on what's happening there and you know i self admittedly i don't really feel too much from the news maybe you're the same way it's all abstract you know but those images were quite moving and so jg ballard the great british surrealist novelist I actually wrote my thesis on, he had this great line, the the death of a fact and how we no longer feel the news and, you know, is in our media-laden world, we are overwhelmed with images and we just no longer feel anything. But I have to say, looking at those images of Afghanis on cargo planes all squished together, trying to escape, ugh, you feel that. You feel that. So... Anyways, a a great show coming up. Uh, We have another event coming up. We have another global mining symposium that is scheduled for September 22nd and 23rd. Just go to events.northernminer.com and you can register or you can also be a sponsor and those have become very popular. So again, just go to events.northernminer.com. It is about a month from now that that event is taking place. Registration is free. And with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Instagram at the Northern Miner. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And you can also find us wherever podcasts are available, including Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, Canada's first rare earth miner had a trading halt when there were rumors that it was going to expand. And the next day, they did, in fact, announce that they were expanding. So Australia's Vital Metals, who own the Nicalico Rare Earths Mine in Canada's Northwest Territories, of course, that used to be owned by Avalon Rare Metals, they are continuing to pursue other properties. And this time, they have signed a binding term sheet to acquire... A 68% interest in Quebec Precious Metals Kipawa Exploration Project and a 100% interest in the Zeus Exploration Properties for $8 million. So the rumors that halted trading were accurate. 
And it's interesting to see the rare earths come up. I mean, that's really how I got started in this industry on that fateful day when I signed up to the Dines letter and him promising riches in the rare earths. And I did ride that bull market. So Vital Metal shares climbed 22% in the last week and 308% in the last year. So that's impressive. I mean, after you go crypto and you come back, these numbers are not eye pop into me. Um, but for the junior mining markets, you know, that's total win if you can three or four X on your investment. So I just wanted to touch on that. I, I think very interesting. So they continue to make moves, Australia's vital metals in Canada's rare earth industry. So I wanted to touch on that. Wheat and precious metals. They have announced record revenue and cash flow for the first half of 2021. And this is by Northern Miner staff. Wheaton Precious Metals announced strong results for the second quarter of the year, saying it remained on track to achieve 2021 guidance of 720,000 to 780,000 gold equivalent ounces. The Precious Metals streaming company said the record sales volume in the first half of 2021 generated revenue of $655 million U.S., including $330 million in the second quarter, an increase of 33% from the same period last year. Cash flow for the first half of the year was $449 million, with $216 million coming from the second quarter of 2021. So, and so I just want to touch on that as well, you know, streamers doing well. And we have a quote from Randy Smallwood, who is Wheaton Precious Metals president and CEO. He said, quote, this solid performance reflects the underlying strength of our diversified, high-quality portfolio and has resulted in an increase to our dividend for the fourth quarter in a row, an increase of 50% over the prior year. So, you know, that's a big deal. And it's a theme we see more and more. As I listen to these conference calls, the dividend is becoming a preeminent topic of importance in these things. And I get the sense that that's a newer phenomenon you know, precious metals companies have not traditionally been super known for their dividends, but I think they are becoming known for their dividends. And a diversified portfolio, surely these money managers are looking at what's going on here and say, hey, gold is cheap, relatively speaking. Gold mining companies are cheap and they offer a big dividend. This looks promising. So that is wheat and precious metals. Continuing on, Tesla and resource to launch final pilot in DRC to trace cobalt from mine to EVs. So this is a huge deal with Tesla and the uh, mining industry, particularly here, cobalt. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the ESG of metals is just going to become an increasingly bigger issue with a premium put on ESG-friendly mine metals. And so here we have... Tesla and they're working with Resource on a solution to trace responsibly produced cobalt from mine to electric vehicle in a pilot project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they are working with Tesla. So this is by Cecilia Jamazmi, and it says here the program is being tested in real operating conditions as multiple on-site pilots, including the DRC in Europe, with further pilots in Asia and the U.S. plan to start later this year. The final pilot across the entire Tesla supply chain is expected to take place in the fourth quarter. The launch of the final industry solution, supported by boutique blockchain technology studio Kria, will follow in 2022, it said. Yeah, blockchain is the obvious solution to this. I've never heard of Kria before, um, but there are there are a couple of major uh, supply chain blockchain coins. Uh, VET, uh, VeChain, as it's also known, is probably the biggest, and Origin Trail is another one, but VeChain, they are seen as uh, probably the industry-leading solution on the supply chain. For your information, continuing on, Tesla struck a deal in 2020 with Glencore to buy cobalt from its Congo mines, but it has been seeking to reduce its reliance on the metal. DRC holds around 70% of the world's reserves of cobalt, crucial for lithium-ion batteries used in the fast-growing EV sector. So yeah, so nothing new here other than uh, Tesla has, is working with a resource 
uh, to really get things going. So this is no longer a theory that we need ESG friendly metals. Like this is happening. Okay. That is your message on this one. And continuing on, Australian Mines signs nickel cobalt offtake agreement with LNG Energy Solutions. So a similar story, this is by Northern Miner staff, Australian Mines has announced an offtake agreement with South Korea battery manufacturer LG Energy Solution for mixed nickel cobalt hydroxide from its 100% owned SCONY project in North Queensland, Australia. The mixed hydroxide precipitate contains both nickel and cobalt and is an intermediate product that can be used in lithium-ion battery production. Under the agreement, LG Energy Solution will receive 71,000 tons of nickel and 7,000 tons of cobalt for a six-year period starting in 2024. The deal is contingent on Australian mine securing financing by June 2022 to build SCONY. So this mine isn't even built yet, and LG is jumping in to secure the supply. The binding offtake agreement also includes an option to extend the agreement for another five years. So get the sense that there's a bit of a scramble for lithium ion battery solutions and product that goes to basically feed these things, in this case, nickel cobalt hydroxide. Interesting. Now, Sentara, after their issues in Kumtor with the Kyrgyzstan government and their seizure of the Kumtor mine, are saying they are still financially strong. Three months later, and this is by Henry Lazenby, Sentara Gold remains, quote, financially strong with solid performance and a healthy outlook at its other operations three months following the Kyrgyzstan government's seizure of the Kumtor mine, according to CEO Scott Perry. And so that is impressive that they are staying solid because I think Kumtor was by far their biggest play. Now let's take a closer look. In its June quarter financial report, Toronto-based Sentara noted its cash position at the end of June was up by almost $60 million dollars. Quarter on quarter at $883 million. They have liquidity of $1.3 billion US with 2021 production and cost items said to be on track at the Mount Milligan and Oxit mines in British Columbia and Turkey. Perry aims to make lemonade with the Kyrgyz government handed him many lemons. So I guess the moral of this story is you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. And so diversification, whether it's your financial portfolio or your mining portfolio, diversity is a, always kind of a tried and tested true strategy. Despite believing Sentara remains the rightful owner of the Cornerstone Gold operation, the company wrote off the associated assets and liabilities of Kumtor Gold Company during the quarter as it could not effectively exercise power over any relevant activities or affect the returns of the mine. So that is that. I, let's see if there's any more that can be done. But as George McLeod says in this interview, more and more you're going to see countries just going yeah, we're going to do what we want, and what are you going to do about it? So, yeah, more on this in our feature interview coming up. And one more story. Rio Tinto has sold the last diamonds from its iconic Argyle mine. It's by Cecilia Jamasmi. And Rio Tinto has put for sale its collection of rare pink, red, violet, and blue diamonds from its iconic Argyle mine in the remote East Kimberley region of Western Australia. Mining ended at Argyle in early November last year after 37 years of uninterrupted production, during which the mine became the source of about 90% of the world's prized rose to magenta hued stones. And we have a beautiful picture on the Northern Miner website of some of these diamonds. They are quite spectacular. The 2021 Argyle Tender being showcased in Antwerp, Belgium, is the final collection of diamonds from the final year of the mine's operation. The number of diamonds presented at the annual Argyle Tender over the last three decades would barely fill two champagne flutes, which highlights the rarity and relevance of this final collection. So... Some interesting marketing here. The collection, called, quote, The Journey Beyond, end quote, makes reference from the one and a half billion year journey from the formation of the deposit to its discovery and its impact on the world's diamond and jewelry history. And we have another picture there. So take a look. Northernminer.com, Rio Tinto sells last diamonds from iconic Argyle mine. Those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. And 
turning to metal prices. We would like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on August 17th, a 10-year bond is at 1.223, so that is down 0.11% on the yield. So yields are coming down, and gold is trading at $1,795.18 per ounce. That is $60 higher than last week's quote. Silver is trading 25 cents higher at $23.90 per ounce. Platinum is trading at $1,023.08 per ounce. That is $31 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $2,608.98 per ounce. That is $18 lower than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading four cents lower at $4.28 per pound. Aluminum is trading a penny lower at $1.18 per pound. Lead is trading four cents higher at $1.11 per pound. And nickel is trading five cents higher at $8.91 per pound. Tin is trading at $16.38 per pound. That is two cents higher than last week. And cobalt is trading a penny lower at $23.75 per pound. And zinc is unchanged at $1.36 per pound. Zooming out, it looks like gold and silver are playing a little bit of catch up after being kind of slow last week. And all the industrial metals are basically taking a bit of a breather as, say, nickel and lead take the lead a little bit higher, but otherwise consolidating at elevated prices. So yields are down, metals continue to be elevated. And those are your metal prices. George McLeod is managing partner at Access Mining, and he is a Southeast specialist who has worked in the region for 12 years. He served as PwC's regional corporate intelligence lead, where he oversaw investigation and political risk assessments, primarily for Fortune 500 clients. Prior to that, George was a journalist who reported on Southeast Asia and Iran. He has appeared in numerous regional and international media outlets, including the BBC, CNN, The Globe and Mail, and The Guardian. So it's a fascinating discussion, as I mentioned earlier. So with that, I hope you enjoy the interview, and I will see you on the other side. Very excited to welcome George McLeod, who is managing partner at Access Mining. And George is based in Vancouver and Southeast Asia. And uh, George brings a very interesting, one of my favorite themes in mining, which is kind of one of the least explored, which is kind of the geopolitics of mining. So I'm very excited to have him on. So George, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's great to finally be able to speak to your listeners. Yeah, it's it's a topic that I just think is so interesting from an economic and a historical perspective, but I'm sure you're the expert here. So tell us, what is it that you do? Well, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my background and why I'm sort of very excited to be in this field. I uh, my I, my background is in is in uh, po- political risk analysis. I I was uh, head of uh, corporate intelligence for Price Waterhouse in Southeast Asia. I spent a lot of time in emerging markets, um, but I actually grew up um, in a you know in a family that was that was very much uh, around the the junior mining sector. My father was a uh, head at a, a Canaccord office in Prince George, and so I grew up with you know, geology and mining very much a part of my life. So what I see developing in in the mining sector and why I'm so excited to be able to combine my sort of political uh, background with with this mining side is that I think that the mining sector has, due to the market conditions, it's largely been ignored um, in in a market sense, but certainly in a political sense. And I think that uh, in the coming years, it is going to change to it very quickly and very drastically, and in ways that I think will 
shocked and probably unsettle a lot of people in the mining sector. I, I think that there's a lot of discussion around how higher higher metals prices will benefit shareholders and benefit people on the corporate level and put money in pockets. But I also think that there's going to be a level of scrutiny politically, environmentally, and, you know, in terms of media and, and in all types of ways that will catch the mining industry off guard. And, and that's why I, I find it so fascinating uh, to be involved in this sector. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we've been seeing this in various different ways. Uh, you know, like we were talking before the podcast about what's going on in South America and, you know, previously thought of as sort of uh, uh, low risk areas like Peru and Chile starting to turn over. We see Mark Bristow, the CEO of Barrick, and you see the kind of compromises, I guess, for lack of a better word, that he makes now, like that you wouldn't have seen from mining companies. 20 years ago, right? Even 10 years ago, uh, much more of a focus on sharing the benefits because I think to your point, I, I think say some of the more astute leaders in the sector, say like a Mark Bristow, he's seen, he can read the tea leaves to, to your point that the climate is, the the political climate is evolving. What do you have Absolutely. to say? Absolutely. And I, and I think, uh, you know, just just to sort of set the stage for this. So what what's happened in the mining st- sector uh, is that we're coming out of a what I would say not just a mining recession but a mining depression that began in 2009 and you know despite a, a sort of brief uptake tick in 2011 lasted up until in my opinion the, the beginning of 2020 yes the stock market started recovering in 2016 but uh, for all in, for in in my view it it, it ended in 2020. During that t- depressionary time, basically three things happened. Uh, companies shut down their exploration departments. That meant that basically they were left with having to service global demand through their existing production. The second thing that happened is that the economy continued growing, which was you know drawing from that f- from that reservoir that was not being replenished. The third thing that happened was that the slowness in the mining sector overlay against um, a booming technology sector, which has led to a number of advancements, such as in in battery technology, which has allowed governments and the private sector to completely change the fuel system of, of, of the globe away from fossil fuels and, and into a, a, an electric modality. I think that's huge comparable to, you know, the railroadization of, of the world in the 19th century. But so the first two issues I mentioned in terms of sagging uh, metals prices and a general recession in, in mining, that, that that's actually not unusual. Uh, we see that in, in, in every uh, mining cycle. But the, so mm-hmm. on that basis alone, we, we could expect to see higher industrial metals prices as we do in every other cycle. But when we add on that third factor that I mentioned, which is electrification, that is going to take things to an entirely different level. And in my mind, a very political level, because what what it's doing is that it's changing the entire texture of industrial metals from from being, you know, an investment on par with, you know, other commodities, pork bellies, grain, whatever to being a, a politically sensitive issue um, along the lines of oil. And we all know that, you know, we all know what governments have done to defend oil interests. You know, countries can get invaded, coups, whatever. And I think that in the coming years, as the supply crunch that I described in, you know, metals such as copper, nickel, zinc come into play, combined with the fact that countries are increasingly relying on those metals for their cars, for their, um, for all these types of systems that are being put into play, they will see, the, the mining industry will see itself thrust into a political light that it, it is not accustomed to. What I'm saying is not particularly uh, often in, in right field either. I mean, if, if you were to say to, uh, you know, the, a, a kid in his early 20s named Mark Zuck, Zuckerberg that he was going to be addressing Congress and uh, you know speaking on the phone with with heads of state 
because of a silly little computer program where people people at a university put photos of their friends, you'd get laughed at. Um, and yet, uh, F Facebook is is uh, is something that is, in my mind, far less politically sensitive than that of uh, of industrial metals. So I think, um, you know. So, so that's sort of a long uh, response to to something that you've noted at, which is um, uh, you mentioned Barrick. I mean, I, I think what's what's happening right now is we're seeing we're seeing a lot of changes going on in the developing world in, as to how uh, mining companies are being treated and to how the types of risks that that they are encountering. I mean, that's that's a canary in the coal mine. Uh, you know, you referenced. Um, Barrick has run into trouble in um, uh, Papua, and uh, Peru is is an especially interesting one for me because I think the business community was really caught off guard by that one. I, I, uh, you know, was putting out uh, warnings of, of, of criticisms of of the uh, low risk premium that 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 the business community was putting out on was was giving to Peru last year, and I think. I think that if if we look at that example, it's it's a very good one uh, that will inform how how things are going to develop going forward. Yeah, so let's dig in a bit there, and and just uh, I think the comparison you're making between say these industrial metals and oil, I think is fascinating. I mean, I think I've heard it said that you know copper is the new oil, and you know it comes down to energy, right? And these civilizations, so to speak, are powered by energy, and so. As you say, it's like these things get it get you know moved from the status of pork bellies uh, to it's a whole order a, a different kind of it's it's a different kind of thing when all of a sudden you're getting energy from the metal or however that works you know when you start to equate that so I think that's fascinating and uh, let's talk about let's go let's talk about Peru and South America a little bit. I mean, tell people not everybody knows what's going on in Peru. I have a vague idea. Sounds like some left wing governments are coming in. Uh, what do you know? Uh, what's going on in Peru? And sure, um, so P Peru is a very interesting case. It's obviously one of the world's biggest copper producers, and uh, you know, I remember hearing co commentators uh, last year even saying that Peru, as far as political risk, ranked um, very low alongside of um, Australia, the US, uh, Canada, and, and Chile. And um, I think that what, what has now, the, what interests me is, is more why, why people would come to that conclusion, because I, I, I found it strange. And so, so what, what has happened, just to give sort of an overview, is that We've is that Peru went from being a it was a fairly uh, left wing, you know, semi control economy uh, up until the early 1990s when a guy named Alberto Fujimori came to power. Uh, he adopted a very uh, pro business, pro Western stance, sort of Chicago school economics, privatization, and um, uh, you know the economy certainly did very well. It brought on a period of sort of uh, fine, uh, stability in the country in terms of inflation, currency, uh, foreign companies stormed in, uh, foreign companies have done very well in Peru. And I think, uh, uh, you know, certainly in the mining sector, people are very happy with, with what Fujimori did. And, uh, but then, then what occurred this year is that a left wing a prime minister named uh, Castillo was elected by a very narrow margin. Uh, that came as a surprise to the business community. But I think I, I, what interests me is that is that I, I think one of the mistakes that people were making in with Peru is that they failed to understand the the hatred that a lot of Peruvians have for the Fujimori dynasty. Now, sorry, just to go back, I forgot to mention that Fu Alberto Fujimori's daughter, uh, Keiko Fujimori, ran against the uh, Castillo um, on a sort of a right-wing platform um, and, and was obviously defeated. So it's one thing for the business community to be, you know, pro-Fujimori, but um, I think that they I, I think they failed to understand the the incredible, as I say, dislike that that Peruvians on the ground have had for 
I mean, I started going to Peru in the early 2000s and you couldn't shut people up about, about uh, Alberto Fujimori. They absolutely detest asked him uh he he actually fled the country he was uh blamed by a lot i mean I'm, look I'm, i don't have a position on this personally i'm just you know but but, but he was sort of I'm, seen I'm, as uh, uh would, would it be fair to say that they saw him as basically a neoliberal uh, sort of person yeah he was and he was you know he, he was and so so the business community liked him but i i think they you, you know the the, sorry, the, the, but the, the regular Peruvians, I think, were saw him as, well, he was also blamed for being behind uh, death squads in a country, a lot of corruption. Uh, he was, as you say, a, a very much neoliberal. Now, okay, if you're from the business community, um, being a ne neoliberal is a good thing. Um, but, um, you know, let's not pretend that that, that necessarily jibes with re regular Peruvians. And so, um, that 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 dislike, I, I don't think, was fully factored in when people were were examining the the political situation there. You know, Castillo is 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 coming from a, a particular position that really resonates with with a lot of Peruvians. You may dislike what he uh, what he says, but um, you know, so using Peru as an example, and I think it's a good example. Um, I would make the call that, Br that Brazil um, is likely to go down the same road. Um, we have a very pro-business right-wing president there, Bolsonaro, and he's loved by the business community. But uh, Lula da Silva, is, who's the left of center, uh, is out of prison and his popularity is soaring. And in, in an election, I, 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 I would definitely... I mean, unless uh, Lula, unless De Silva gets assassinated, which is a possibility, I, I would definitely look at him being a serious contender in the election. So what are the implications of this if of all these like, like, you know, what we might, I guess, I don't know if we can call it a populist movement. I mean, I guess we can, but that's sort of a loaded term. But all this kind of what we might say is just rise of more kind of left wing governments that maybe are more likely to. Uh, nationalize and where the, in a sense, where the business community won't feel quite as comfortable. Like, how do you see this playing out if we do get more of this? Like, do you think, say, in Castillo in Peru, he talked about nationalization in the lead up to the election, but do you think once he's in power that it, you know, may not go that far? Or is this just who knows and anybody's guess? Well, it's it's uh, so I'm going to relate it back to the broader context that I mentioned. When metals prices were lower, like 2016, I don't think the mining industry would have as much to worry about. Um, one of the great things about being a depressed industry and a boring industry is that no one pays attention to you, and it's often good in an emerging market to be ignored. Given the scenario that I mentioned with higher metals prices with an increasing you know, sensitivity that I think will develop towards metals in particular, copper especially, which is what they have in abundance in, in uh, Peru. Uh, I think that mining companies have a lot to be concerned about, um, not just directly because of Castillo, but, be, but because, see, see what's gonna happen is that with, with the scenario that I, that I mentioned, um, these governments will start to see metals as national property rather than private property. Now, you asked me what, what I think is going to happen specifically with, with Castillo. I mean, he, he was very, you know, soapbox type politician during the, uh, during the election campaign. And since then, he's toned down the rhetoric in his, you know, for example, in his inauguration speech, the main concern right now is with the the possibility of a new constitution. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, you know, the the mitigating factor is that is that he does face a uh, a Congress uh, that is not um, on side with him, and he obviously did get in with a slim margin. But to engage directly with what you say, I don't think it really matters on the short term. I think that. As, as metal prices rise, and another thing that I forgot to mention that's critically important is that the finances of a lot of developing countries have declined significantly since COVID. They're not in critical state in South in, in Peru, but 
so you you've got you've got a a much worse economic situation a much worse debt situation and these crises as well they tend to take a few years to play out on the street and I, and i think that going forward uh, any mining company operating in these types of jurisdictions needs to be very cognizant of the fact that, as I say, as, mo- as metals prices are higher, they will run the risk that, that the, the governments look to them as an easy target. Now, the, the other critical thing that I, that I need to highlight is that mining industry is unique because in you know in this increasingly virtual and globalized world this is the only this is the least virtual uh I- industry i can think of because you can't you can't just pick up and move a mine you know you can close it down which is sort of you know committing suicide but you you you, you can't move a mine so you know governments are, are are cognizant of that and and if they're facing budgetary pressures and popular pressures and trade deficits they're going to look to these base metal mines and they're going to say you know what we're going to do x y and z to you what are you going to do about it yeah you know it reminds me of and chile is another stark example i think it was just last week i was reading stories on how they were getting it from both sides these companies there's all these copper uh company strikes in Chile, I think it is, on one hand, so they're getting it from the workers. And then on the other hand, the government is also in Chile, another supposedly safe jurisdiction traditionally, is proposing fairly dramatic legislation. And and again, I don't think any of this has passed, but it's being proposed and discussed. And so all to say, to your point, People are paying attention to the price of the metal, including the people who work at these companies. Like people aren't, you know, clueless about this. And because you see these guys getting pressure from all sides, is that how you would read it? Yes. And and the the you know you brought up the the issue of strikes. When when we talk about uh, political pressure on mining companies, the, usually um the the first things that come to mind are things like windfall taxes and expropriation in extreme examples but um i think there's a whole other spectrum and i and i've seen this and dealt dealt with this with with companies in the developing world there's a whole spectrum of other things that um companies face when they're in a difficult or hostile political climate that um you know I would, I would say with windfall taxes and expropriation, the, the good thing about them is they're at least transparent. Um, you can fight them. Whereas, whereas there's th- this whole host of other issues like um, competitive harassment, regulatory harassment, even authorities turning a blind eye to fraud. Um, you brought up strikes. I mean, if you have a, if you have a, 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 a government that's friendly to labor, they could potentially you know, incite or uh, support strike action against a company and and make it uh, difficult or even impossible to do business. There are examples of that happening. I mean, Rio Tinto had that happen to them in Indonesia in the early 2000s. So uh, I would say that, you know, when, when we're talking about the, the political situation unto which a in, in which a, a mining company operates, we would have to introduce a whole other host of issues that they can encounter besides the more uh, transparent ones. Now, there are other hot spots in the world. I mean, you're based in Asia, but you were mentioning Africa before we, we talked. Tell us about other hot spots in the world that you think could sort of be uh, more likely to flare up. And just a quick thing, like I was listening to Barrick's conference call, which I might do uh, profile next week. And was, this was from a week ago, his conference call. He was saying how he was paying a lot more attention to Canada, you know, yeah. and how and the opportunity in Canada. And again, I, I Mark Bristow seems to me one of the most astute CEOs in the whole mining industry because he really seems to understand the situation uh, before a lot of a lot of people do and he he takes a leadership role towards his his job as ceo so tell us about other hot spots like what do you see well okay so in in terms of um so you you raised you raised the issue of africa i mean it's there's so many countries there i'll I'll just uh i'll i'll talk about a, a, a few and some generalizations so africa had uh, benefited from debt forgiveness in the early 2000s um that obviously put them in a pretty good 
pretty good situation. But in recent years, the borrowing has has restarted, and a few of those countries are 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 not really looking in such good shape in terms of their budget balances now. Africa has not been hit very hard by COVID, but I'm I, I'm telling you with certainty right now because I was I was there recently and I've got a pretty good network there. Africa is going to be hit very hard by COVID. I was in Senegal and uh, they received um, a large shipment of vaccines through the international community and they basically got thrown out um, because people just didn't want to take them. Uh, oh. So people aren't vaccinated, you know, so, and this doesn't, this doesn't make the news. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't believe it. I, I went down, I actually got vaccinated in Africa and, and, and uh, you know, I went to the clinic and there was just no one there. Nobody wanted the vaccine. So I got mine and I, you know, it didn't involve any, you know, under the table payments or phone calls. They just, you know, yeah, in and out, it was easier than getting it in Canada because as I say, nobody wants them. And this isn't only wow. Senegal. This is uh, this is other other countries in that region. I mean, I, I I've got um, friends and contacts involved in the distribution, and they're talking about this happening in, in a lot of countries there. And um, on top of that, you know, so so you have an unvaccinated population. You have you have the fact that these new variants are developing, and they obviously they you know they mutate. Um, and so you've got a population there where those variants can further mutate because they're they're not vaccinated. And so this will become an issue uh, in in the coming months. So that's one thing that will that will hit those economies and it will hit their budgets because every country that's been hit by COVID has has had to uh, go into severe deficit. So so that. That, as I say, will, will you know play into the other risk risk issues I've mentioned. You, there is a lot of mining activity, and because Africa has you know sort of come into its own in the past 12, 15 years because of uh, better stability, um, you know, more benign and progressive governments. There has been there has been increased activity in the extractive industries. So, uh, if you take um, another another issue that is facing some of those uh, countries, uh, and that's the fallout of the collapse of Libya. And this is a massive issue because of Libya's collapse. A lot of these uh, insurgency groups have been able to operate there and are now expanding increasingly into the into the adjoining states. So Burkina Faso, for example, um, which actually is in very good shape in terms of its uh, debt situation. So I think it's about 45% debt to GDP ratio. It was held up as a, as a real shining star in the region. They're now getting hit with serious issues with insurgency, uh, instability. I, mean, I was talking to a guy from uh, the World Bank who was questioning about the, uh, you know, the, 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 future of the of the government there because of this um so that's something that i'm certainly watching now uh i mean on the on the flip side i would say actually one of the one of the more positive ones is the drc uh it might surprise you to say that i think that the uh the mining companies there are quite cognizant of the risks and they've they've addressed them quite well and i think that a lot of the uh instability in that country has been baked into the into the cake already so i would say that's one of the more benign examples on the continent but uh going forward the, those issues that i mentioned those those macro issues of higher metals prices i think will potentially place um mining companies in a more difficult spot in that region yeah and what's really kind of freaky about what's your what you're saying is i mean we see the as you call it, the insurgency. I mean, I call it, you're the expert here, but you know, the, the security situation in West Africa seems to be really deteriorating. We've seen some pretty, uh, in the last couple of years, you know, we've seen some pretty violent things go on. Like, you know, was it a hundred over a hundred people in one, like if memory serves, like that got killed or, or some convoy got attacked. Uh, like we've seen some pretty dramatic things out of West Africa. So, you know, if and you get like Boko Haram and you get them and then instead of taking over the oil field, 
maybe they take over the copper mine. Like, what do you think about that? Well, it's uh, I, I have no problem with your with your narrative. Um, I, I would you know I would say that I, I don't have any specific information that that would happen right now. But but given the scenario that I mentioned of of as I say metals prices rising and declining security situation and you know increasing sensitivity of those of those uh, materials i can definitely see a scenario where copper and and other base metals are treated in a comparable way to to that of oil now having said that because i don't want to be too too negative and and i'm not I'm, I'm not negative i there there are a lot of companies that navigate navigate these these types of environments which is actually which is a point I'd like to get to one the, the typical way I've found that that companies deal with political risk is through government relations person which can be a, a very good tool but I think companies have to be very cognizant of, of other risks associated with that because so what a government relations person is just to, to step back is uh, you know, it's usually a sort of knowledgeable former government official or, you know, somebody who's well connected in the political community and can um, address, you know, everything from banal issues of, you know, your, your you know, driver's license is, is, has been blocked to bigger issues of, uh, you know, export permits, you know, concessions, whatever. Um, they, they deal with everything on the political side. So that's important and that's good. But one thing I've I've found with with uh, a lot of companies that have government relations teams is that the government relate if you if you take on a government relations person you're taking on all of their their good contacts and their good network but you're often also taking on some baggage and I mm -hmm. think companies need to be cognizant of the fact that you know government relations people have their own interests um, they have their own um, the, they'll often be allied with a certain faction or a certain political party. So when you get married to this government relations person, you're marrying all the all the bad relatives as well as the good relatives. You know, and and uh, you know another risk is that if if they are tied to a certain faction and that faction gets turfed out of power, then you have another set of problems. So, you know, my point being, it's good it's good to have a government relations person. It's good to uh, have that capacity, but you you know you also have to have an in-house understanding of you know the types of risks that that can be generated from that. Absolutely, it sounds like a very delicate situation where you want to create alliances, but you don't necessarily want to be associated with these local politicians. Like you just want to be working with them, but. You, I mean, you see it with in Afghanistan, as we see the disaster that's happening over there, all the people that allied themselves with the Americans are all of a sudden, you know, public enemy number one, as the Taliban comes in, to your point on, you know, how these alliances and, you know, you don't want to get too close, potentially from Absolutely. a pragmatic point of view, you know? Absolutely. And I think, I think mining companies do certain things very well, their, their ability on logistics and technical levels is incredible. I mean, what what other sector could set up a mine in the middle of the you know, Irian, the jungles of Irian Jaya, West Papua, or the Anti Plateau in South America? I mean, it's it's astounding. But where they're often weak is on the political side. And um, as as what what we're discussing will, will come into force, I think mining companies in a way will become. Um, they, they will have to become almost more politics companies than mining companies. They'll have to put politics right on the front burner alongside their core business in order to survive because you can have the best, you know, property in the world with great reserves, great, you know, infrastructure, great talent. But if the government takes it away from you or makes it impossible to do business, it's worth nothing. And you know, you brought up the the uh, it, you know, and I, and again, I'm not I'm not trying to be hellfire and brimstone, but because there are companies that are able to navigate these very difficult environments, but I, I think that as as the the as the prices rise and as the security situation declines in many countries and the level of sensitivity of 
base metals increases, um, the mining industry will be quite shocked by the amount of attention they're getting, the amount of political scrutiny they're getting, and how um, they're they're no longer being treated as as business people. They're being treated as uh, political actors. Yeah, I, and I it's back to Barrick. Like I think Mark Bristow can see this, and I think that's why. Like I think his strategy is to just give them a vested interest. It's like, you know what, we're going to give you a whole bunch of the pie so that yeah. you guys don't want to shut us down, you know, because you're making too much money here. I think that's his strategy. Like I even see that he's trying to reopen up Pasqualama. I mean, which was, you know, kind of over and dead. And you know, he's working on the Argentinian side, uh, trying to get, uh, I think he's calling it Lama. The Lama side of Pascual Lama. Now, so before you go, I, I want you to talk about China a little bit and maybe China and Africa and then China in general, if you have much to say on that. Sure. I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of China, I think on a, on a macro level, um, the takeover of Afghanistan is probably going to cause the United States to be a little bit harder, uh, harder line with with the PRC. Um, I think that you know the U.S. has gotten a, a bloody nose from that, and and they're going to have to compensate in other areas. I think they'll become closer to Iran as well. Hmm. Um, to uh, I also uh, I also think that uh, R- Russia is more likely to make a move on on uh, parts of the Ukraine because of it. But to to engage your question about the PRC uh, in terms of investment and mining activity I, I something i follow quite closely because i'm interested in it it's not so much for you know direct uh, professional reasons but so back in about 10 years ago china started to make big moves into the natural resources sector in southeast asia and it made a lot of headlines for example they they started taking big interests in myanmar's offshore oil and gas industry through their state-owned companies, Sinopec and CNOC. So, you know, a lot of analysts were saying, oh, that, you know, China's taking over, blah, blah, blah. Uh, And then it sort of disappeared from the news. What happened with that is they just absolutely, I mean, they came in full force, but but it was an absolute fiasco. I mean, they threw money at their concessions, completely bungled up the exploration, uh, used their own people, refused to use locals, and after you know f- about 500 million dollars later uh came up with nothing so you know the the i think one of the points i I'd, I'd make is that china wants to have a bigger role in natural resources and they want to be a bigger player globally through bri belt and road initiative but they make a lot of mistakes uh, their companies make a lot of mistakes. They uh, another example actually is in Canada. Um, they made a big move into the zinc sector in uh, about uh, ten years ago, and again, you know, going, you know, all all guns blazing, and uh, they they yeah com- completely bungled it up. It, it was a disastrous project. The project is sitting in fallow right now with polluted uh, water. Um, the Yukon government is on the hook for cleanup costs. So, yes, China is China is making these efforts. It's it's uh, you know it's trying to secure resources, but at the same time, it's it's making a lot of mistakes. And I wouldn't overestimate that country's uh, abilities on the ground compared to what you're hearing in the public domain and in the news. That's interesting. So you think, in a sense, in some respects, they're their own worst enemy they're they're absolutely their own worst enemy and um you know they i mean they've done some things right they have a strategic metals reserve which i think is very smart and they've had you know they they've had they've had some successful projects but i i think as well politically there's people tend to underestimate the degree of hostility towards the prc in a lot of these countries that are otherwise thought of as friendly. Like in Southeast Asia, the, there's a lot of political dislike of the PRC, with the exception of Laos and Cambodia. In uh, in in Africa, there's developing a, a sense of dislike just due, due to the fact that um, you know c- countries are, are are on the hook for debt, and you know they've been they've been given they've they've been lent all this money. And they're happy to borrow it, but nobody likes paying back. And then um, certain countries like Sri Lanka have seen assets seized. 
So right. this this doesn't really bode very well. I mean, the U.S. went through a similar thing when they uh, lent all that money to Latin America, and uh, you know, the, those countries weren't particularly happy when they went when they went bust as a result. So, you know, I'm I'm quite uh, tepid in my in my view of of the uh, PRC's uh, efforts in the developing world and their their successes there. Now, just a final question, and then I'll. I'll let you tackle whatever you want if there's anything else. But how seriously should we take China's what I would consider kind of aggressive moves to secure resources? You mentioned there's stockpiling and securing resources. Like, how much do you know about that? Because to me, I just see a drip. It's a drip, drip where every, you know, basically two or three weeks, it feels like maybe it's more, maybe it's less. There's another mine that's getting bought out and somewhere in the world. Some resource, some little gold company, some copper thing, some zinc thing. Should we be concerned about this? Yes, uh, de- definitely. And but but I would also say when you when you read about those takeovers, take note of it and then look look back um, six months, eight months, a year, two years later to see how it went on the ground, because a lot of these investments don't go particularly well. You know, you have uh, a very there's a huge amount of corruption involved. There's, you know, you get these business tycoons who are being pressured to make these investments on behalf of the uh, of government agencies. They don't know what they're doing. They're using dubious contractors. So, you know, again, the intention is there. I don't doubt that they want they want to secure global supplies in these. But, I mean, frankly speaking, Western uh, mining companies have a far better reputation. And a far better track record than uh, those from the PRC, and and so I would, you know, I would just urge people look in the look in the backlogs of 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 you know these takeovers, and then and then look at how they resulted because it's there's a huge mismatch there. So yeah, so check out the story a year later and see how it played out. I guess. Sure. So, is there anything we've missed here? Is there anything kind of big that you feel like we should be talking about in our discussion? No, I mean, I think I, I, you know, you 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 mentioned Canada. I mean, I I sort of feel bad saying this because I'm Canadian and it feels like a conflict of interest. But I do think that Canada is is the top uh, jurisdiction right now for mining. I, I went up to northern Quebec recently because I I it, there's a lot of mining activity there. And one thing that struck me, and it's so obvious that I, uh, but but I never really had a concept of it that. So if you go to Quebec, the, the farthest north you can go is a place called Radisson, and that's it. There's no road um, beyond that. And it, But if you look at a map, Radisson is only about 30% uh, north of the border. So up north of that, you just can't go there. I mean, you can you know, float plane, but you, you, you can't go there. The same with Ontario. I mean, um, most all of the population in those provinces is south of the 49th parallel, 150 miles north. There's nothing. Almost nothing. So my point being that that Canada is 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 really untouched. You know the the amount of exploration in this country is almost entirely in the south, and I think that exploration is 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 going to open up in these areas that have never been and looked at before, uh, as well in the Yukon and and none of it. So that's one thing. I, I think also politically, it's it's a good country. There's no there's nothing on the horizon that points to it turning down a bad road for the mining sector. Uh, the main challenge is, you know, with permitting and, and the length of putting a mine in production. There's also, you know, controversies with First Nations groups. But on par, I would say it's, it's, a, very, it's a very top-notch uh, destination uh, globally. And I think that we'll be, hearing, uh, we'll be hearing a lot more about, you know, big, big investments from, as you say, Barrick. And and other companies like that, um, and the you know the other sort of usual suspects of United States, uh, Australia are are also you know continue to be very very good uh, mining destinations. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what you're saying about Canada, uh, and I'm actually quite skeptical often of the policies, but I think they've started to get things together a little more, and I think there's this kind of confluence of events where. As you say, it's untouched. I'm from Saskatchewan, like northern Saskatchewan. It's like, like you say, all the roads in Canada are like on the bottom half of the country. Like you can't even get to well, the bottom. 
the bottom, bottom quarter, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's, well, we're both from Western Canada, and I, in my view, my sort of, I don't know, mental view of the country was always very much that, you know, the West is this virgin, unexplored uh, wilderness, and the East is is this industrial heartland. Well, it actually, I mean, you can drive from, you know, north to south, west to east in, in BC, you can't, as I say, you you can barely drive anywhere in 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 uh, Quebec and Ontario. You can't. Same with with uh, northern Canada, Saskatchewan. If I'm not mistaken, I don't think the road goes right to uh, the Northwest Territories. None of us. Sorry, from, I don't from think there. so. Like, I mean, I could be uh, wrong, but yeah, like I mean, yeah, like northern Saskatchewan. Like again, I, I don't have a map in front of me, but I think it's like halfway up the rectangle there. You know, yeah, like that's, that's northern Saskatchewan, like halfway up. I mean, I could be wrong on that, but I mean, that, that's how it seems. Like it's pretty remote, uh, and so. And but what I was going to say is, that Canada has this great mix of ESG uh, kind of reputation, and like you're saying, these Western companies having good reputations. Plus, you put the low political risk. You, you have the security down south. I mean, nobody's going to attack Canada anytime soon. One would think. Uh, so it seems like a pretty sweet place to be. Yes, and I, I mean, I I think, um, I believe it was Rick Rule who said recently in an interview that he was talking about political risk and he made the comment that Canada shouldn't get off scot-free because he expected that if, if mineral prices went to a certain level that companies could expect to have things like, you know, increased royalties and, uh, windfall taxes and the like. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, so apologize to, to to Rick if I'm, you know, misquoting. But what I would say to that, and I agree with him, is that in, in Canada, first of all, any type of government actions like that are are going to be transparent compared to in higher risk markets where you will will see things like, as I say, um, you know. Uh, hostile politicians targeting uh, your assets, you know, non-state actors b- targeting your your assets, you know, other types of under the table activities, um, and plus, I think that Canada politically has a has an, a very strong understanding of the importance of the mining sector as a as a national priority. Um, so I, I don't see the Canadian government ever going too far in in any particular direction. I mean, there's a you know we had an election called yesterday. There's nothing coming from the NDP uh, that suggests anything un, unusual. That we have an NDP government in BC, which is sorry, the NDP of course is the left wing, the you know the Labour Party, what have you. Uh, in BC, we have a, 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 a Labour NDP government, which has been very pro mining. So I don't see anything on the horizon that points to uh, a significant change uh, it, uh, in, that, that would negatively affect mining companies. Well, a wonderful place to leave it. George McLeod, thank you for the fascinating discussion. Great. Thank you so much for, your, for the interview. It was great speaking with you, Adrian. You as well. We, I wish you well. And if, if people want to learn more about access mining and yourself, uh, where should they go? The, well, you know, we have our website. I'm, uh, I am going to be more active uh, in terms of uh, producing content and social media. Um, and so look forward to more uh, in the coming months. Okay, excellent. Okay, thanks, George. And we'll talk to you again. Thanks. Well, we're definitely going to have to check in with George again because I feel like we're just scratching the surface on that interview and it went way long, but uh, there was just a lot of ground to cover there. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, We're going to have some more interesting interviews and I think we might do Barrick's conference call next week because there were some very interesting little nuggets in there uh, as you were hearing in this interview that we just listened to. So I hope you're having a great summer. Wherever you are, if you want to help out the podcast, you can leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. Until next week, take care.